Hi everyone, thanks for joining on. Uh, we're going to start at about five past. That's normally when the overwhelming majority of people who are joining are going to have joined. So we're going to go quiet for a couple of minutes uh, and then we'll do all the intros and everything like that and get kicked off. So bear with us for just a few minutes while everyone joins on and then we'll get started. Thanks everyone. Couple more minutes, everyone, and then we'll get started. Right, okay, we're good to go. So thanks everyone for joining on. Uh, this is the third in our series of masterclasses with the very best trainers in the industry. I'm very, very pleased to welcome Jeremy Snell onto this webinar. Uh, he's gonna be doing deep dive candidate qualification. The first couple we've obviously covered identifying the lead, 
qualifying the job and um, now we're moving on to how to make sure you can get those candidates get the right candidates for the role uh, and keep them engaged just a bit of an intro to jeremy he's running recruiting in lockdown.com you can see the link on his presentation there and what i'm going to do is just paste the link to jeremy's uh, website in there they've had literally hundreds i think now into the thousands of recruiters signing up for uh, recruiting in lockdown it gives you all the tools and tips you need to recruit into this market so jeremy's obviously covering deep dive candidate qualification in this session but there's a huge amount more content that covers every element of what you need to know for recruiting in this uh, environment the feedback we've had on it um, as a sort of third party has been phenomenal um, so get looking at that it's only 20 quid as a one-off payment um, so incredible value as well with two of the best trainers in the industry running that so please do take a look at that it's well worth it I'm just going to post a couple more links now uh, as well so here's a link to Jeremy's LinkedIn he'll be very happy to connect with you and also as well there's a link to my LinkedIn and also to Sourcebreaker as well so feel free to connect with all of us start following our company page as well um, for more tips tricks and things you can use to help you through this period and some value for further on but recruiting in lockdown fantastic feedback on that well worth having a look at that so that's enough waffle from me guys i'm going to pass you on to jeremy who's going to go into the session today um please do feel free to ask questions what we'll do is many of you have been on before we'll probably answer a lot of those towards the end of the session if there's anything particularly we need to answer in the middle we will try and do that um but jeremy will um pick up with you guys now um and thanks very much let's get cracking Superb. Thanks very much for that introduction there. Um, uh, I appreciate being invited to, to attend. I think this is a really exciting series of webinars that uh, have been organised, um, each one building upon the previous to be able to take something um, from, from cradle through to grave in terms of generating a lead and then finally making a placement. Um, I'm going to focus on deep dive candidate qualification. Um, it's a subject which is very close to my heart, having spent a long time working as a recruiter. Um, one of the, the key things that helped me to differentiate myself from others I was competing against was the level of understanding that I had of the candidates I worked with uh, and my, my, my ongoing focus on making sure that it wasn't just about getting CVs to a client and putting people in somebody's inbox, uh, it was about making sure that they could successfully on board and engage the right person, which is much more about maintaining the attention of the candidates that you're working with. Um, as always happens with, with every training session, I think it's worthwhile to start by setting some objectives for this session. Um, what I'd like to be able to make sure that we cover is how to be able to conduct a rapid deep dive qualification of a candidate. Um, I realize that from time to time, we may be under pressures to, to deliver shortlists, to be able to find contractors for clients. Uh, I don't want that to become an excuse for us cutting a, a call down, which means that we end up missing things out. So everything that I'm gonna share with you, we should be able to, to get this fitted into a single call and to be able to conduct it to a high standard in a relatively short time scale. We're gonna look at how to be able to assess people's capability, how to be able to assess their skills. We'll look at digging deeper into people's motivations and their drivers to truly find out what it is that they're looking for. We'll look at qualifying the roadblocks and qualifying those roadblocks early because the earlier we can see the roadblock, the, the better armed we are to be able to navigate our way around it. Uh, and then we'll look at closing on action making sure that we have a fully committed candidate who understands the process that we're going to go through. Uh, and then finally, I'll share with you the three most common mistakes that I see recruitment professionals make, irrespective of their level of experience and service within the recruitment industry. Um, so let's, uh, let's get stuck into it. Uh, and the first thing that I want to do is, uh, I have a question for, for everybody out there in terms of a poll. Uh, I hope that Steve's able to, to help sort me out in terms of uh, getting this poll poll out there to you all. But the, the question that I have for you, how much time do you spend qualifying a candidate on the phone? And if I just add a little to that, how much time do you spend qualifying a candidate who you think is a good match or a good fit for the job that you're working on? Uh, and we have five choices. Um, less than 10 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes, 15 to 20, 20 to 30, and finally 30 minutes plus. So 
So Steve, could you uh, deploy the poll for me? Yep, the poll is underway. So we've got um, in fifth place at the moment, 6% of people, 7% of people spend less than 10 minutes. Okay. 15% of people spend 30 minutes or more. And then we've got 22% 10 to 15 minutes, and it is neck and neck for people spending 15 to 20 and 20 to 30 minutes. So 30% of people currently 15 to 20 minutes, 27% of people 20 to 30 minutes. Well, that's really encouraging to hear because I, I feel that there is a definite balance between making sure we're investing enough time in the person that we're talking to. There's a lot to be said for somebody feeling invested in. To, to begin that that buying process, um, but also making sure that we are using our time wisely and efficiently to be able to get the most out of it. Uh, so um, everything that we'll go through here, if you answered B, I think maybe you need to start to invest another three to five minutes. If you are C or D, everything that we'll go through should fit into the time scale that you're already allocating to qualifying a good candidate and if you are uh, picking e and you're spending half an hour or more qualifying a candidate you may need to reconsider is everything that i'm going through important and and starting to to, to bring that down to a more manageable uh chunk of time so that we can uh qualify a, a, a larger number of candidates so thanks very much for for everyone who participated in the poll uh let's have a look at the the first uh, of the subject areas that I, I was going to share with you in terms of qualification and this is about assessing people's capability and assessing people's skill uh, and I've put here that caution is advised and the reason that caution is advised some of you may have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect before in essence the Dunning-Kruger effect is that people who are of average capability misappropriate how good they are at a certain task or doing a, a certain type of activity. And, and some examples, some real evidence of, of the Dunning-Kruger effect in real life, 42% of software developers, when asked, believe that they are in the top 5% of their profession in terms of capability. So if you recruit software developers, and you are relying on a software developer's self-assessment of their capability that they may be putting into their CV, they may be misappropriating just how good they are at doing their job. And, and, and there is no way that 42% of people can be right to say that they're in the top 5% of their profession. 68% of people who were surveyed by the DVLA, 68% of drivers in the UK believe that they are an above average driver. Again, that is not possible. And the most interesting one of all, uh, I'm not sure if I, I put myself in this pool of people who are called lecturers, but uh, lecturers within universities, 92% of university lecturers believe they are in the top quartile of their profession. So therefore our role, our, our role as a recruiter and as a consultant is on behalf of our clients to be able to make sure that we are truly assessing people's capability and skill and finding the evidence to demonstrate their ability to do a task. So I've got um, a, a number of different tactics and strategies that, that I'd like to be able to, to share with you to help you to do that. The first one, uh, and this is, this is a classic that, that sometimes happens in job descriptions and then starts to fall into the assessment process that recruiters apply, where we misappropriate tenure for meaning capability. So what I mean by that is, when somebody asks for somebody with five years experience, the assumption that's written into that is that somebody with five years experience is going to be more suitable and better than somebody with four years experience. When the reality is, the amount of time that you've spent doing it doesn't automatically make you more skilled at that thing. It may be that somebody has spent three or four years doing that and has had more exposure to it and therefore has spent more time in a shorter tenure doing it, or it may be that the person who has been doing it for a shorter tenure has done it to a higher standard or to a higher level of technical capability than others whose CVs would suggest that they're more experienced. So it can be a very dangerous playing field to start to compare candidates based upon the number of years experience that they claim to have of deploying a skill or, or, or completing a particular task. And I'm sure that all of you would, would, uh, would 
would um, recognize what I'm about to, to say here, and I, and I hope that this resonates with you. I, I could introduce you to people who have been doing the same job for a number of years. So they may have three years tenure, but what they might have is three times one year's experience. Because what's happened for the last two years is they haven't improved or got better or been challenged any further at doing that thing. So they've ended up with three times one year's experience as opposed to three years experience. So if we if we overemphasize tenure as meaning capability, assumptions can start to creep in to the recommendations that we make to clients about who they should interview because of their CV. When really their CV is what we're going to use to be able to ask the right questions to truly understand their capability to deliver something. So it's all about demonstrable evidence. And our goal on the phone is to seek the demonstrable evidence that they can operate at the level and with the capability that the client has briefed us on based upon the, the job qualification process that Trevor shared previously. Because when we know exactly what is expected of somebody, we can start to ask the right questions and start to dig deeper to be able to find out what somebody's true capability is of doing that thing. So a really nice question or a prefix to a question. Tell me about a recent piece of work. So if we're being briefed by a client who is asking us to find somebody with good experience of building e-commerce platforms, we need to be able to make sure we're asking questions to understand somebody's capability to do that. So the question could be, tell me about a recent e-commerce platform that you had to build from scratch and how you did it. And as the individual we're asking the question starts to, to give us color and content, we can ask further questions to understand their role, the goals, their objectives, and how they went about doing it. And it is far better to be able to draw from somebody's past experience where they demonstrated the ability to do it than it is to ask them theoretical questions about how in an ideal world they would go about building an e-commerce platform. So this is what um, is sometimes described as being a competency-based interview question, but we're looking for somebody's competency or capability to be able to do something. When I spoke with Steve a couple of weeks ago prior to this session, uh, one of the things that, that I shared with him that I observed a lot was that, particularly within technical environments, when a recruiter is looking for somebody, and let's say that they're looking for a .NET developer, when they're looking for a .NET developer, their search begins with a Boolean search that revolves around the technology. But what the client is going to interview somebody for is their ability to use that technology to achieve an outcome. So just because we have somebody with five years experience of coding within .NET, that doesn't mean that they are better than somebody with four years experience of coding within .NET. And it doesn't mean that they can deliver the project that the client has, which is going to be delivered in .NET. Because if it all came down to X number of years experience of using a particular piece of technology, then that would be the same as a rec to rec looking for a recruiter and trying to find somebody who has a minimum of three years experience of phone. Now, every recruitment business owner would like to be able to hire people who know how to use the phone, but they're likely to have a certain outcome that they're looking to influence and a project and a frequency with which the person will pick up the phone to be able to say this person has exactly the capability that we're looking for of using phone. And I think that's exactly the same for a development manager. When a development manager is interviewing .NET developers, they're less hung up on phone or .NET and far more interested in, tell me about the stuff that you've been designing, what's been its practical application, and how did you go about doing that? And when you start to bring that assessment into your initial phone call, when you're screening the candidate, the candidate starts to feel like they're truly being assessed. And there are some candidates out there whose perception is it's far more about trying to get their, their authorization to submit their CV rather than doing an assessment on behalf of their client. I believe that the majority of candidates who are out there are only one step away normally from becoming a manager. And if they're only one step away from becoming a manager, what you're doing is you're creating a pipeline of future clients who when they compare you to your competitors, 
and the quality of your questions to assess their true capability rather than your questions that were designed to get some commitment to be submitted as a CV for consideration with a client, they start to see you as being a recruiter of choice. So these questions for me start to become part of a value proposition that will help you to win more business, both with the candidates who you are asking the questions to when they become clients in the future, but also how you can then start to describe to your end client about how you assess people for their behavior and their attitude and their capability, rather than looking for X number of years of tenure of using a particular skill set. So the question that's up on screen, tell me about a recent piece of work. I feel that that question needs to be asked to every candidate before we're able to say, this person is definitely a contender. Rather than being a candidate, let's go looking for contenders who are likely to be offered the job. Because if, if job flow has dropped, and I think the job, job flow has dropped from pre-COVID to now, it is far more important that what we're doing is we're working towards ensuring we fill every job because there are less of them about. And, and much of that is taking what the client may do in their interview into our telephone screen so that we're doing the first stage interview before they even meet the person. And the impact that that will have, not just in terms of your CV to interview conversion because of the quality of a cover sheet that you can write, but your conversion of first interviews to offers or first interviews to second interviews will be greatly influenced because you're truly matching based upon what the client is looking for, which is capability and behaviors. So as well as the, the question, tell me about a recent piece of work, explain to me in more depth how you did that. And if somebody talks about how they did that, this starts to become the evidence that we can share in the future with our client as to why they should interview them. And we move away from saying, I found a really great candidate. They've got six years experience of doing that skill in a similar size business. And we can start to say, I found a really great candidate because they have a demonstrable capability to deliver what you're looking for as evidenced by the answers to these questions. And when you start to provide information that is based upon behavioral assessments, the hesitation factor, the hesitation of clients who haven't had a chance to read through CVs and having to read through CVs to decide who to interview without having been able to ask any capability questions, ultimately they're just comparing skill sets to skill sets. When you bring that to life because of your ability to assess that capability, then you'll find that your CVs will turn into interviews far quicker because the hesitation factor has been removed because you've done and asked the questions that the client is seeking to find out the answers to as well. And then lastly, and this is a great question to, to ask candidates because it tells you a lot about their employer as much as it does about them. What was discussed in your last appraisal? And when this starts to become a question we're using to assess capability, what we're also assessing is the manager's perceptions of the individual who we're talking to. What we're also assessing is what does the career path look like for this person? And what we're also assessing is what are the threats that we may encounter when it comes to counter offer time, or if we're dealing with a contractor when it comes to extension time. So the whole assessment of capability, it's the deep dive questions to really pull through the evidence that we're seeking to, to find. And all of the questions that we want to ask, they're embedded in the answers to the questions that we asked during the job qualification process. So we've got our question stack ready. We know what the person needs to be able to do in terms of their mission when they arrive. So we can then start to think about what are going to be our key questions to be able to make sure that we're truly assessing capability and somebody's skills at performing the task. So I trust everyone is comfortable with the way that I'm describing that. Um, and it may well resonate with you from training that you've had in the past. And some of you may even say, oh yeah, I used to do that. I used to ask a lot of those types of questions. After this session, if this is an area where you feel that you want to dig a little bit deeper, then have a look at your um, uh, recruiting in lockdown, the, the competency-based interviewing sessions that we have there and the questions that we have that revolve around interviewing. And if anyone wants to, to get truly good at, at interviewing, it starts by asking the right questions to pull through those, those behaviors from the past. So let's move on from assessing capability and skill 
and let's look at something which which can be a little subjective, which is motivations and drivers. So the image which I'm sharing on screen, it shows an iceberg. And, and the iceberg model is a classic model to, to be able to, to start to define how people behave. So we have this large mass which is sat in the water. And there is a very small visible piece that you can see which is uh, outside of the water. And this visible piece, this is all we have to calibrate when we're talking to people. It's how they behave. And it's the words that they use and how they describe things. The larger mass, which is under the water, this is the thing that we want to dig into because these are the values and the beliefs of the person that drive their behaviors. So, if any of you have ever had an experience in the past where you have questioned the behavior of a candidate and you've questioned it so much that, that you've even turned to colleagues in your office and said, why did he do that or why did she do that i would never do that what you're doing is you're taking the top of their iceberg which is their behavior and you're putting it onto your value system and your value system may be different so your behavior would be different in that scenario so to get good at assessing people's motivations and drivers we need to go below the water and start to understand more about their values and their beliefs it's no secret what I'm about to say. In some quarters, the recruitment industry does not have a great reputation. Some of that reputation is fair and some of it not. But whatever is fair and not, it is still a reputation. You may encounter candidates where it is the first time you've ever spoken to them, but you may be the third or the fourth or the umpteenth recruiter that they've spoken to in their career they will have a certain belief system about who you are and what you value and what your mission is, not based upon you, but based upon their experience of working with other people. So when you do find one of those really good candidates who you feel looks like a strong contender for a client, and you know that you've never spoken before, be wary of the fact that their future behaviors may be based upon their experience of working with not you but a competitor. And if you feel that your value systems and what you bring to the candidate universe is better than your competitors, they may not know that until they've experienced it and they can see it in hindsight. So what I recommend is with every fresh candidate who you talk to, ask them one simple question and start with a softener. So a softener would be, hey, I'm really interested to know. And as soon as we say, hey, I'm really interested to know, they come in closer because it feels quite engaging. Hey, I'm really interested to know what's been your experience of working with recruitment agencies. And it's not that I'm fishing for a bad experience. I just want to understand what their experience has been to then think about what does that mean their expectations are going to be of working with me, having not experienced it in the past. And then if I can install a new belief system about working with me, they can keep their belief system about the other agencies, but now we install a new belief system about working with me. That is such a powerful question to ask people, and it will drastically reduce the number of ghost candidates that you end up encountering because they're ghosting based upon their experience of working with other agencies far more frequently uh, than they're ghosting because of the experience of working with you. All of those people who say, send me a job description, I'll have a look at it and I'll get back to you. The ones that never then return calls, they feel that that's appropriate because they've done it many times before and it's never been an issue. If we can deal with that early, we'll reduce it greatly. So alongside the, the, the iceberg model, uh, things that I would recommend uh, become part of your own thinking process. Not everyone you talk to is going to tell you the truth about their motivations. So if I divide the job seeking world into two distinct groups, active and hungry, I'm definitely looking for a job and tiptoe to passive. If the right thing came along, I would look at it, but I'm not doing anything about finding it. So if we take the first group, these are the individuals who are active and hungry. When they apply to your advert or they put their CV on a job board, they're likely to have rehearsed in their own head, what am I going to say when I'm asked, why do I want to leave? Or why did you leave? They're likely to rehearse, what am I going to say when I'm asked, what am I looking for? Which is why so classically, we'll end up hearing things like salary, location, 
and duration on a contract because they rehearsed in their own mind what should I focus on as being my primary motivators and then what may happen in the future is they turn something down that isn't linked to either rate salary location promotion prospects or brand and they turn it down for reasons that weren't discussed before because they chose as a strategy to share what they thought you wanted to hear rather than the reality of why they were doing what they were doing so as long as we accept the fact that this is a strategy and because it's a strategy to achieve a goal as long as we align with them to help them to achieve their goal we may be able to influence the strategy that they pick which means we need to dig a little bit deeper dig down into that iceberg and tap a little bit more into their unconscious mind so when I ask somebody, what are you looking for in your next role? A, B, and C. As soon as they've told me about A, B, and C, if we then put that out there and say, well, what if I had two opportunities that were paying the same in the same location and they were of the same duration, how would you pick? And what else would be important? And what else would be important? And we start to pull that apart a little bit will start to get more progress towards truly knowing what motivates this person because the things that they start to say where they haven't had the opportunity to practice it, they're coming from the unconscious mind, which is far more likely to be the part of their brain which is truly telling them about what's important to them. So that dig deep, tap the unconscious mind, it is a really simple process because, because really what it revolves around is just asking one more question. And, and uh, something that, that, that I'm going to share with you as a, as a PDF that I'm about to put up on screen. This is, this is the motivation grid that I recommend that consultants use when they're talking to a candidate about their motivations. And the grid falls into, into four equal quadrants. So the motivation grid that, that we see in the picture, we have four quadrants. One is push. What is making you decide to do what you're doing? What are you looking to move away from? And when we understand what people are looking to move away from, it gives us a really good understanding of how they're going to make sure that the next role that they take is the right role for them. The push piece can sometimes be confused with the pull piece, which is what they're moving towards. So if I give you an example of that confusion, if I ask a candidate, why do you want to leave your current job? And they tell me, I would like to join a company where there is more progression, they're answering a push question with a pull answer. So I need to go back to the push question again. What is it that's made you decide that you need to do that outside of your existing company? And now maybe they'll talk to me about a recent one-to-one -one that they've had with their manager. Now they might talk to me about being overlooked for a promotion that somebody else in the team got. That's their true push. And if I write down the pull factor as being a push factor, I haven't properly assessed this person's true motivations. So push and pull are like a balance sheet. And when we know everything that somebody is moving towards and everything that they're moving away from, we've got a really good understanding of the toward and away motivation that the person is experiencing now. And they become invaluable as we pass this over to the next session that revolves around interview management to make sure that we're talking about push and pull through our preparation and our debrief process. The other two quadrants, reject, what would make you reject a job? And there's a killer question just in there, what would make you turn down a job? Because as soon as they talk about things that would make them turn down a job, then we can start to understand a bit more about why those things are so important and we can test what we have in push and pull. If you haven't asked a candidate this question before, then try it because the, the, the results can be really astonishing. When was the last time you turned down a job? When you ask somebody, when was the last time you turned down a job? When I shared that with somebody last week, they spoke to a candidate who answered it with yesterday. Yesterday. And then assessing the job that they turned down started to provide a future phone call to be able to convert a lead into a job. So actually understanding why people would reject jobs is just as important as understanding why they would accept jobs. If somebody is looking to leave a job, there was a reason why they took it and there's a reason why they're moving on. And when they took it, they may have looked at other jobs to be able to pick the one that was best for them. And when we understand how did you pick and how did you choose which ones you rejected? Powerful stuff. 
And then finally, the last grid, what would make you stay? What, what, what could your current employer do to get you to stay? And this isn't just a perm question. This is as appropriate for contract recruiters as well. What would happen if they offered you a contract extension? Well, no, they told me that I'm due to finish at the end of June, so it's definitely ending. The number of times that I've heard that being said to a consultant and then suddenly out of the blue, the contractor is offered an extension. It's the equivalent of the, the, the contractor's counteroffer. So understanding what would make people stay or stop looking is as important as push, pull, reject and stay. And the most powerful question to have in the toolkit is and what else? Because if we keep asking and what else, we'll have more and more content. And I would recommend we keep asking for more things until the person has no more things to share. It used to be, it used to be popular within recruitment to ask candidates, what are the three most important things that you're looking for? And I agree we need some priorities, but if we only ask for the three most important things and we don't discover the five other things that will be part of the consideration, we're likely to arrange interviews that match the three and they're likely to accept things that match the other elements within the five. So the questions that revolve around what else? There, there is a lot of content in four boxes, but as we look at it, we can then see we have, we have a motivation map here for the person that we're talking to. As a consultant, I used to have that as part of my candidate qualification sheet, where it was a, a section of my A4 page drawn into four boxes to make sure that I was populating all four of those things. And that stayed alive and was present with me all the way through the interview process. Now let's have a look at uh, some, some roadblocks and some deal breakers. This is a big decision for some people. And given what's going on in the world at the moment, it may be an even bigger decision people for some. So it's really important we understand what their concerns are. And when you've found somebody who you think is a really good match, and you've worked really, really hard to be able to arrive at a point where you have two or three contenders for a role, we don't always want to hear the dark side of things in terms of what their concerns and problems might be. The earlier we talk to them about their concerns about change, the earlier we talk to them about their concerns about a different employer or leaving, the more time they have to come to terms with it being a reality. So just because you ask people to change jobs every day doesn't mean that they themselves change jobs every day. And at some point they're going to sit down and they're going to go through their decision making process. And I would much rather you understood how they make decisions rather than allow them to make decisions without your counsel. And for some people, it's not a big decision at all. Some based upon their ecology, they just need to find a job, right? But if we are going to be asking people to resign, or we are going to be asking people to, to move away from where they've been contracting to contract for us somewhere else. We may be asking something bigger than we realize. If we think about what could stop this from happening, things get in the way all of the time and often rear their head at the last minute. Things that could stop this from happening could revolve around changing conditions at work, personal situations, considerations that they haven't really thought about. You think about the, the typical question early in a process, what's your notice period? And a candidate says, I think it's a month. And the consultant writes down one month. They don't write down, I think it's a month. And then when we get near to offer stage and the candidate looks at their contract and they realize actually their notice period has changed and it's three months, that can be a real kicker for the end client and could become a deal breaker. So being mindful of some of the language that people use and knowing what typical roadblocks could look like, and then just asking outright, what could stop this from happening? And if the candidate can see that there are things that could stop this from happening and we can come up with plans as to how we can deal with that, we're far more likely to be able to get this over the line. And then if they are looking at other opportunities, if you get offered all of them, based upon what you know, which one will you take? If this happens, then will that happen? If I get you an interview on this, what will you do about the other job? If we get you an offer this week, what will you do about those other interviews? And the more that we're talking about that earlier, the more time there is to be able to ensure that we're consulting effectively with our candidate to help us both achieve the goal that we're sharing, which is to find the right job in the right timescales. 
So <clears throat> there, there's a lot that, that's been, been unpacked there in terms of assessing capability, looking at motivation, considering roadblocks and deal breakers. If we have a look at the, the action plan that we want to close on, we've gone through all of that motivation. We've assessed all of that capability. We've now got a roadmap to fully get them on the hook. And we need to get them fully on the hook and act as if this is going to turn into a deal so that we are talking about when we get them interviews as opposed to if we get them interviews. Because if we start to talk about it with a little bit more certainty, they will think about it with a little bit more certainty. And if they're thinking about it with certainty, then they're more likely to have their concerns come to the surface sooner and we can deal with them now rather than waiting for it to happen in the future. And for every candidate who you feel is a contender, who you genuinely believe the role that you have for them is right, I would recommend that you set them a mini mission. And when you set them a mini mission, you may ask them to perform a certain task which may be to, to write some supporting evidence that you can include with their CV to be able to help the, the, the interview process. And when you set a deadline for writing that supporting evidence, it's the beginning of commitment that they will then remain consistent with. And I would much rather hear somebody say, well, I don't want to write that now. See if you can get me an interview and then I'll think about doing it. Because I don't think that they're fully on the hook. And I can't let them go until I feel like they're on the hook. So the little mini missions in terms of write a supporting statement, review the client's website and let's talk tomorrow first thing in the morning and we can discuss what you've discovered. Sending them uh, what I would call a, a candidate experience pack for them to go through. Maybe getting them to do a, a video to be able to support their application. Anything that feels like it's a genuine test because when it feels like it's a test of their commitment and they commit to do it, I feel much more certain with the journey that we're going to go on with the candidates. And closing on commitment, let's make sure that they know what we're committing to do for them. I think a lot of recruiters, when they think about closing candidates on commitment, it's all about the candidates' commitments to them. And what gets lost in translation is the commitments that they could give to the candidates. This is what I'm going to commit to do on your behalf. And this is how I'm going to represent you. And this is how we're going to ensure that we get this over the line. And when you describe your commitments, we can create a balance sheet then of what we would look, what we would want back from the candidate in return. And then we can agree our next contact. And let's agree our next contact with a definite date and a definite time without it being a woolly promise of speaking at some point in the future, such as I'll get back to you as soon as we hear from the client. So now that we've closed them on action, the three most common mistakes across all levels of experience of recruiter, irrespective of tenure, because tenure means nothing, it's not necessarily capability. The first one is unconscious bias. An unconscious bias can kick in really quickly when we're looking at a CV, because as soon as we're looking at a CV and we start to decide that the candidate is perfect, we haven't even spoken to them yet and we're setting a frame that the candidate looks perfect. When we're looking at the profile of somebody on LinkedIn and we decide that the profile is ideal for what the client is looking for, all of it is going to have an impact on the quality of qualification that we go through and the amount of questions that we ask, which could create two outcomes. One is we end up on the phone for less time than we had intended because we'd already decided they were right. And because the candidate doesn't feel fully invested in and understood, they're not as committed to the role as we would like them to be because we didn't do the assessment process that was necessary to make them feel like they were a good fit for it. Or the second thing is we miss certain questions that later in the process come back to haunt us that might revolve around other interviews that they have, their notice period, threats to placement, their, their family situation or the concept of relocation. The second most common mistake is not digging into true motivation enough. And, and true motivation is understanding why somebody wants what they want, not just what do you want. Because when you understand why they want that thing, that's the emotional trigger that we play to all the way through our recruitment placement process. And then finally, ignoring the early warning signs. And if we ignore the early warning signs that this may not be as successful as we would want it to be, the candidate who says, 
Yeah, of course, Jeremy, you can put me forward if you want. If I want is less important than if they want. So if already they don't sound fully committed to it and it's something that is for me rather than it's for them, I may not have actually done enough of a sell here to show them how good this job is. Um, if we're, if we're going to ignore the early warning signs that somebody is late getting back to us with feedback or, or CVs aren't, aren't being fully updated or we're, we're not getting returns of phone call as, as quickly as we would like, we don't deal with that. It's only, it's only going to, to get worse. So those early warning signs in that first qualification call, if we deal with them there and then, we're far more set for a good quality placement. And then the, the, the final thing that I, 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 I would close all of this with, for every candidate who you currently have in play, whether that is CVs are currently under consideration, or candidates who are in interview process, the challenge for you is this. Based upon what you know about the candidate, their skills, their capability, their attitude, what percentage probability would you put on them being offered the job? And even if that comes down to, to the basics of, well, it's between my candidate and another candidate, so I would say it's 50-50. So there's a 50% chance of offer. If you then look at the candidate and based upon what you know about their drivers and their motivations, their reasons for leaving, their reasons for looking, and you understand about their, their decision-making criteria, if they get offered the job, what percentage probability would you put on them accepting it? And if your probability of acceptance is 50% and your probability of being offered is 50%, then it is a 25% chance of being a deal because it is 50% of 50%. So if you started to score all of your interviews, percentage probability candidate will take it, percentage probability the client will offer, and multiply the two together, that's the probability of deal. And it's surprisingly accurate how good that is. So that's that's my that's my uh, that's my piece. That's my thoughts on, on the entire process um, of of qualifying. I, I, I'm interested to know if anyone has any any questions that they would like to ask me. Um, yeah, please or, fire away with questions, guys. I think one of the th the key things I took from that, Jeremy, was um, the quadrant is really really useful. Not something I've seen before, but definitely allows you to really dig a lot more deeply into all of their drivers and all of the different directions. Um, Piece things together, yeah, much more effectively. That is definitely a, um, yeah, a really good lesson for me. Um, so yeah, anybody with any questions, please put those into the um, into the question section. Send them along. Um, Emmanuel has asked about uh, explaining the push and pull once again. Just a quick yeah, summary sure. of that. Um, so push and pull. Um, if if we if we look at motivation as being something that either we're moving away from or something that we're moving towards. So if we think about a job seeker, a very common question is why do you want to leave your current role? That becomes a push factor, but only if the answer sounds like it is a push. So if somebody says I want to leave because I want to work for a bigger company, it doesn't automatically they mean they want to leave because it's a small company. So if we take them back to the original question, so you'd like to join a bigger company. How long have you felt like this? And what's been happening at work that's made you decide that? And it might be that there is less promotion prospects because the team is very small. So they now feel that more opportunities exist in bigger companies. So it, it doesn't always equate that they're, they're, they're going to be opposites of each other. So the push is what are you moving away from? The pull is what are the attractors that you're looking for? Good stuff. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, Margaret is asking, can we get a copy of the motivation map? So we will send out a copy of um, the slides afterwards and you'll also get a recording um, recording of this uh, webinar sent through to you um, as well. Sharon mentioning about she's an experienced recruiter. I think this will resonate with a lot of people. Um, some really good pointers in here, but she's you know, as an experienced recruiter aware of a lot of it, but it's a great minder, doesn't always uh, or doesn't always do those. Eamon's a big fan of the question about the appraisal. I uh, wanted mm -hmm. to just point that out. Um, really good question to um, to be asking there. Claire is asking around tenure. Um, do you believe that somebody with no experience could potentially be better than someone with a couple of years experience? Uh, 
Yeah, 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 I do. I, 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 but I think then what we're assessing is potential. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody with zero experience has the potential to be better than somebody with two years experience. Mm -hmm. I agree with. Um, I, and, and I don't mean to be. Sorry, who who asked that question, Steve? So that was Claire. 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 Yeah. So so I don't I don't mean to be too rude about the the recruitment profession Claire but there are some people in recruitment who've been doing it for two years who quite quickly are outperformed by somebody who is new hmm. um, so yes yeah I think it's yeah, fair to say dependent on the um, dependent on the position for a software developer someone with no experience will take a little bit longer to become productive in that situation but I think yeah um, Agreed. I'm personally definitely a big believer in ability over experience I can agree with that um so elliot is asking how do you best deal with a candidate that started to so show signs of going cold um what's the best way to approach their you know to question i suppose their keenness without you know being a bit abrupt and asking them directly about um about that right <clears throat> so I, I think that there's there's only three real options one is just proceed and ignore it, which I think is a pretty poor path to follow. Uh, mm -hmm. The second is kick them into touch, um, which is a bit of a harsh strategy as well. Uh, and the third is is to discuss some feedback. So I think I would start the feedback with how interested are you in this and what do you see as being the pros and cons of, of this role? And then having got a, 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 a the lay of the land, then deliver some feedback based upon if their words. Are, I'm really, really interested in it. Then I would give some feedback that perhaps what they've been doing isn't always suggesting that that's the case. Um, and try and bring them back into into a, a behavior model of, well, if you're really interested, then mm -hmm. you, you'd probably be a bit quicker to, to come back to me with feedback. Mm -hmm. But if, if there are if there are genuine reasons as to why they couldn't then then you've got to take those into consideration as well mm -hmm. um cool so we've got alex asking would you always follow the um same qualification process regardless of whether you have a live job or not yes because if i don't have a live job then my capability assessment will give me a very powerful bit of ammunition to be able to market out this candidate as a high value candidate. So the evidence that I've got in terms of their capability to do something becomes a very compelling um, spec process to be able to find them something. And I would still want to, to assess their motivations in the same way uh, because the, the, the level of buy-in that that will create from the candidate uh, will mean that, that, that I'm creating a, a future engaged audience of people rather than uh, a database of CVs. <laughs> yeah, great stuff. Okay, um, so Sharon's asking about how do you assess potential? Um, what was you were talking about? People with potential can be better than people with experience. How do you how do you assess that pre-employment? Mm. If you're deliberately looking for people with potential where experience isn't possible, uh, then there's, there's three different things I would recommend that you do. One is uh, consider running assessment centers so that you can then create tasks that are designed to assess competencies that should demonstrate potential. Second would be to create um, mock-up scenarios uh, to, to see how somebody behaves. Uh, for example, you could create um, a, a mocked up intray exercise, uh, which is how a, a lot of the large management consultancy firms are, are assessing people's capability before they, they've, they've had the chance to gain experience. Or, or thirdly, uh, you, can, you can consider using role play if it is soft skills that you're looking to assess potential within. Mm -hmm. um, like if, if you're looking for somebody who is going to be a future developer and, and a star developer uh, then looking at how you test somebody's logical thinking or critical thinking becomes a competency that you can as assess without having to assess their coding capability mm 
Good stuff. Okay, we've got a question from Barry, which I think is a really good question that's relevant to um, to most of us, something I definitely experienced when I was recruiting. How do you break down the barriers to someone who thinks we're just CV facilitators? So they don't value what we're doing, they don't, you know, they don't respect what we're doing, they don't want to answer your questions, but you know that that candidate is a really good fit for your current hiring plans and you want to be able to get them, you know, be working with them and get them across. Wow, that's a big question. Mm. So, if somebody's perception is that you are there to administer a process and you're a CV filter exercise, is, is that what you, you see Barry's asking? Yeah, pretty much. So, CV, somebody just pings CVs around and they don't understand what a recruiter has to actually do in order to make the placement. They just think you find a CV, you ping it over. And so, I remember when I was recruiting, a friend of mine couldn't believe that I'd make two, three placements a month. He, was, he thought I'd be making five placements a day. I think that's the thing, people who don't recruit, I said to him, if I was making five placements a day, I'd be a millionaire. Um, but I think people who oh, don't yeah. do recruitment don't quite realise the volume of work that goes into, um, yeah, that goes into that. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah, I, I, I get that. And, and I, I think it's, it's the same when a client has no idea what you do either, right? So I think it's an education exercise, Barry. Um, my, my personal preference would be to start with what's been your experience of working with recruitment consultants and then understand a little bit more about what they believe it is that you do or alternatively we could ask them the question of um, if you were to own your own recruitment business that worked in this marketplace what would you do differently to make the candidate experience better mm, great um, question. And, and as soon as they start to talk about what well, I would change A or I would change B. We're getting to the nub of some of their issues without it feeling like we're judging them for their issues, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. But but I, I think a lot of it just revolves around their beliefs about what it is that we do. The other the other alternative is to is, is to drop into story mode. Mm. And maybe tell them about a story a story about a candidate who was a little bit skeptical or didn't perceive the value of what was being done and start to give some insight as to how you do the job in your story rather than give them a lecture about how you do your job. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like the candidate to feel like as I go through that story with them, they are aligning themselves with the, the, the hero of the story, which is the other candidate. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah 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 i'll go along with that completely i think yeah the storytelling side of things just makes things so much more real for people doesn't it and they can understand about when, yeah, when you did that in a previous placement you made this candidate successful and got them a great job it then makes it much more convincing for them to understand all right okay this is this is actually what happens behind the scenes and this is the success that's been had from you know from doing this um, from, uh, and we must all we, we must all have like um a war chest of stories i'd imagine um, and it's recognizing which story is most appropriate for which person. Um, you know, I, I can I can still remember telling telling a story about a candidate called Sheila, who told me she wasn't interested in the job that I had because she was really happy where she was, and she hung up on me. And I gave her 24 hours to cool off a little bit, and I went back to her, and said, I didn't want to let you down by just leaving it. <laughs> And she did go for the interview and she did get off of the job and she did start. And it's a, tr it's a true story about Sheila, the accountant, right? That um, just just being able to have those types of things in, in, in your locker is far better than just sales speak, if that makes sense. And I think as well, if you're brand new to recruitment, it's borrowing colleague stories and using those yeah. as examples. Um, so yeah, to help get your point across really well um, as well when you're a bit newer to the industry. Uh, so Kat and a couple of others asking around, um, when you're qualifying the candidate um, and you get a sense or a warning, for example, that they may be emphasizing their skills and not telling you their true motivations, even when you're trying to dig deeper, do you just, uh, what would you recommend doing? Do you keep them in the process even though you have concerns or would you pull them? That becomes one of those common sense judgment calls, I think. Mm -hmm. the, the thing I would say is if you're starting to have doubts and it's early in the process, it would be less painful to pull them out 
than it would that they fell out at the end. And I think when you start to have doubts about people and you share that and say, look, I'm not entirely sure this is 100% the right thing for you because there were a couple of things that we've discussed and, and I don't feel that long term it's right. And you take it away from somebody. The ones who want it will fight for it. And it's the actual taking it away to test. Are you going to fight for this? But if the candidate says, well, actually, yeah, you're right. It, it is a long way to travel. and I've not really worked in that sector before. So yeah, you, it, it's probably better that we leave it. I'd rather hear that early phrase than, than late phrase at offer stage. Mm -hmm. um, Good stuff. Adam is asking about the appraisal question. Um, so what kind of thing are you looking for from the candidate's response there? So Adam would imagine that they'd give themselves a high appraisal to make themselves look better. Is there something in the, their answer I should be listening for specifically? Um, when I've asked the question, uh, one thing that, 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 that is, is apparent is not every business does an appraisal. So suddenly appraisals can kick in when somebody starts to, to, to make moves that they're, they're leaving. And, and that's how counter offer scenarios come up. So if, if I ask somebody what was discussed in your last appraisal and they start to give me some content that sounds as though they're, they're talking themselves up. Oh, my manager said I've, I've been the best person in the team. They're really pleased with the work that I've delivered. And yeah, it, it's been awesome. My my frame for that to push that back to the candidate. Well, I, I'm surprised that you would truly consider leaving if that's really the case. Because if if it sounds though everything is going great, are they really going to make that step to leave? if they're being looked after so well does that make sense yeah absolutely i think as well getting getting those specific okay. examples from people as well if the hiring manager is saying um you know sorry if the candidate saying that the man their manager said oh they're the best in the team is looking for is like oh, well, what have you you know what, what are the specific things that you've done that make you stand out from your colleagues yeah. and just dig a bit deeper rather than my appraisal was great it's more what was yeah, it yeah. About that makes you makes you great as well. I think it's um it's good. It's, the, gran it's um, the granularity of that detail that starts to help you to become the the human lie detector. Yeah. So Freya is asking, how do you deal with a client who's set on hiring a candidate with a minimum number of years of experience? We've all been there, haven't we? Yeah, we have too frequently. <laughs> um, I'm going to start by not answering the question because I'm going to tell you why they end up asking for people with certain years of experience. So it ends up in, in a requirement list because either the person who is leaving had that amount of experience, so they're, they're looking to replace Bob with Bob, or they're looking to replace Bob with Bob Junior, who joined with that many years experience. The other way that it happens is a manager starts to think about what do I need somebody to be capable of doing and how long did it take me to get to that point? Mm. So if a manager is looking for somebody who is very good at unpicking their own code and rewriting stuff and they decide I didn't really get competent at that until two and a half or three years. They then decide, right, the, the line in the sand for a CV is three years. And because they find it more binary to be able to review that quickly on a CV and maybe they haven't encountered a recruiter who can actually do the digging to find the capability, it ends up being used by HR and line management as, as a basic sift. So in terms of how to deal with it with the client, if the client says we need somebody with three years experience of this thing, Jeremy, my question is, what do you feel that somebody with three years can do that somebody with two can't? And if they can then describe a capability of something or an exposure to something that they are linking to three years, their answer will probably start with, well, I would assume I would assume that they would have more exposure to using this particular tool this frequently. How important is exposure to that tool with that frequency? Really important. So if I found somebody who had two years tenure, but had that same level of exposure to that tool at that frequency, are you telling me you don't want to interview them? So we kind of deal with it as a as an objection, but we're just looking for what what is this what is this a marker for 
because it clearly isn't going to be. We found someone with five years experience, let's offer them the job. That was a really long answer, wasn't it? I'm sorry, Steve. No, 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 I think that's absolutely spot on, isn't it? It's getting understanding what they want that candidate to have been able to demonstrate they can do to a competent level. And it's then pushing yeah. back saying, okay, well, if I found you a candidate who can, who we can prove can you know, perform that task or has that skill set, but doesn't necessarily have three years experience, um, would you be interested in pushing back on that? Is, yeah, I, I think, yeah, great answer. It's, it's getting to the bottom of what they see as being what that three years means as opposed to the, you know, the actual amount of time. Yes, yeah. and, and, and therefore we could find someone with 10 years and mm. accidentally think that they're twice as good for the job because they only need five years experience for it. Yeah. <laughs> and either, either, either reject them because they're too experienced yeah. or get overly excited and go to the client and go, oh my God, I just found someone with 10 years experience mm -hmm. without ever really recognizing just what a hole we were digging. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Well, Bobby is asking, is there anything that works particularly well in getting commitment from candidates? I know you mentioned videos, but I was wondering if there are any more. One of the things that I, I, I finished the, the, the slides with Bobby was, Commitment starts with you describing your commitment to the candidate before you ask for the commitment back. And I know that that's really obvious outside of a candidate conversation, but if we were to listen to a typical phone call at that moment when things are being zipped up and closed, it's all about the future and not about this is what I'm going to do for you. So first thing is make sure that you're really explicit with the level of commitment you give to your candidates to help them to achieve their objectives. The second is asking enough questions about how important it is that they find the right role and what would be the impact of either not finding it or taking the wrong one. The answers to those questions are the reasons why they should commit to work with good recruiters who understand their drives and motivations and not just the skills that are listed in their CV. Mm. And, and I don't think it's an exaggeration for me to say two thirds of people who who get into recruitment, they begin their search for a candidate with a Boolean search, which is finding skills and, and buzzwords. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And because, because they're driven by that, it's where they start to focus the majority of their attention. Mm -hmm. When really it's making sure we understand who is this human being, not the developer, who is this human being and what are they really looking for? What are their hopes and what are their fears? And how do we start to be able to, to use those to help them to feel more committed to working with us because they feel understood? Mm -hmm. Yeah, great shout. I think um, something that works particularly well for me when I was recruiting in terms of the candidate demonstrating some commitment to getting them to perform a task as well, um, as what Jeremy was saying, the task that worked really well for me is Taking when you're taking the job spec from the customer and you've got the key bullet points of the essential skills or experience that 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 hiring manager or that hiring company is looking to um, looking to see from candidates is sending those to the candidates and just asking them to write a paragraph or a couple of lines specifically relating to each of those bullet points, but not just um, not just listing that you've done that experience. Again, getting away from this whole I spent two years doing the monthly statutory accounts or I spent two years writing code in Java, for example, moving away from that and moving far more towards, I have this experience and this is what I achieved you know, using that experience. So what did you do when you were preparing the monthly statutory accounts? What did you actually achieve that was a real benefit to the business rather than just completing a task? What did that actually mean for the company? So were you able to reduce the amount of time it took because of the way that you did something? Did you introduce something that sped things up that reduced costs, that kind of thing? And getting the candidate to spend a little bit of time doing the hard work for you so that they're actually pointing out their key achievements that make them specifically relevant for that role rather than, yes, I've done this for two years. Yes, I've done that for two years. Um, so I think that's something for me that um, that worked particularly uh, particularly well. And it's those achievements which start to separate out the the the, the strongest contenders. Um, and strangely, I saw I saw a survey of two thousand five hundred uh, technical candidates. So they were either from engineering or IT. And of two thousand five hundred candidates who were asked, "What is the most important thing on your CV?" Only 18% of them felt it was their achievements. Wow. 
So 82% wow. of people aren't considering that as an important factor for their CV, which, which does two things for me. One is when you're searching for CVs, use the keyword achievements and you'll find right. the 18% of people who stick it on there, mm. which, which automatically then puts 82% of the average over here. But then bringing back the 82%, there will be achievers amongst them who have yet to declare their achievements because no one's mm. told them how important it is. Mm. But if you're if you're up against up against the wall and you need to find good people really quickly, then then the keyword achievement is really powerful. That is a great shout. I've never thought of that. Very nice. The same um, as if you did a search for the word references, how everyone puts references on their CV. But if you put references not available upon request, you'll find the CVs that have got all of the references without it being a reference to references are available upon request. Another great shout. Okay, so Alex is asking about frequency of staying in contact with the candidate. Well, how do you how do you balance between staying on top of them, but then not actually being annoying? <laughs> well, I think it is based upon the the level of hunger that the candidate has for change, and your assessment of because of their hunger, how erratic you feel they might behave. And I know that sounds really judgy, but if, if I feel that somebody is, is a bit rabbit in the headlights and in panic mode, they'll need to hear from me more frequently just to maintain an, a level of calmness so that they, they don't end up making the wrong decision and jumping into the first job they get offered. Hmm. If they are what I would describe as being the, the tiptoe or passive candidate, then I think that the frequency still needs to be there and a minimum of, of once per week if they're in a process if not twice in a week mm -hmm. because because things change so often um just what they see on the news is going to have an impact on their perceptions of if they're doing the right thing when they start to talk to their family at the weekend as a catch-up it'll start to have an impact because it'll enter the conversation so i just want to be there as their as their as their mind is still kind of crystallizing as to, to if they're doing the right thing or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great chat. I think another thing that's handy as well is having a reason to call other than just making it feel like it's a check-in call. So obviously with yeah, the yeah. quality of the qualification you'll have done with Jeremy's tips, you're going to know a lot about the drives of that candidate, what they're interested in, what they're not interested in. And so it's using that knowledge of what drives them, what they're, you know, you'll find out what they're into outside of work, that kind of thing. It's just having good reasons to give them a call to strike up a conversation and, and stay in touch. It doesn't feel like the same conversation on repeat over and over again, mm -hmm. just checking in, I'm just checking in, I'm just checking in. It's actually having yes. a reason to have the call. Um, and at that time, you're building more of a relationship with them as well. So they're less likely to let you down, hopefully. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, completely. Yeah, I think some people end up treating a candidate like a wobbly tooth and they just can't stop touching it until they fall out. <laughs> That's a great analogy. <laughs> okay, right, we've got um, Anne has said, uh, so this is a live current role for Anne. So she's got a candidate, a final stage interview. Company now seem keen to offer. The candidate's been with the company for 15 years in different roles. The reason for looking is they've been with the company, current company for a long time, but as they're an analyst in their job, they'll need something special to make them move. They've attended three interviews. So it seems like there's a bit of motivation to move there. Uh, and Anne's just looking for, and is looking for things to, to know what to make, what may make this person actually take your job other than just the financial uh, rewards. Okay. The first thing I would say is we need to talk to them about every reason why they should take it apart from financial reward, which should be the cherry on top of the cake. If there is no cake and there's just a cherry, then it's likely they'll get bought to stay. Mm -hmm. So we need to build a bit of a cake with this person. 15 years in the same company. Questions that I would have for Anne, that if she, if she can answer it, great. If not, they're, they're, they're rhetorical. Has the person done exactly the same job in the same company for 15 years, or have they had multiple roles in that business and progressed through the 15 years? Because the person who's done exactly the same job for the 15 years could be in danger of being institutionalized to work there. So I think that the, the, the reality of, of things is we, we probably need to have a, a state of the union conversation with this candidate without it being about an offer, 
but just about their decision process. Um, I would want to ask the candidate, being realistic, how many job moves do you think you have in you before you're working at the company you retire at? And it may be that they can imagine retiring where they are, and in part that's making them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But that means if they only have one more job move or two more job moves, it's really important that that is an educated move. And if that's an educated move, they need to make sure that they're joining the right organization that will take them forward. And then we could go through a balance sheet of the opportunity that you have and what the opportunity would look like if they stayed where they are. Because there, there, there could be, and I don't know the candidate or their employer well enough to say this with certainty, but they could have become part of the fabric of that business to the point where they're being taken for granted. Hmm. And if that's truly the case, then they're probably going to start to plateau and flatline in terms of the impact that they have, and they'll start to be known as good old Bob. It, only if they're called Bob, though, right? But if they start to become, <laughs> if they start to become known as good old Bob, then they probably are now on a, on a ticking clock towards pension time. Mm -hmm. and, and and conversations like that with with somebody can can be a bit of a bit of a um, a smell the coffee moment. And they've got to make sure they do the right thing for themselves and for us to help them do the right thing we need to talk that through and i'd much rather we talked it through with them out loud than they rehearsed it too frequently in their head and kept putting two and two together and coming up with five mm -hmm. so i hope that helps Anne. yeah i think it's a great answer i think um something else to think about as well is touching on a point jeremy was making previously about um candidates when was the last time they turned down a job is drawing back on that with the candidate that's been there 15 years and if they've never looked for a job before it's had you ever thought about leaving the company previously and then when you're having those thoughts what was it that actually made you stay at the business because they may well have never actually actively looked but they probably entertained yes. the idea of it what, what what meant that that was only an idea they entertained what you know what stopped them from actually looking to move on um getting a bit of an understanding there um yes. Well, there's there are some real positives that the person's been for three interviews. Yes, yeah. So so there, there's definitely a purpose that we can see there. It's whether they have the enough push factors to want to do it. Because if you've been there 15 years, there would have to be something seriously big happen for you to wake up in the morning and go, right, that's it. Today's the day. So it could be something which has taken some time for them to come to terms with, and they may have arrived there already. Mm -hmm. sure. I'm interested to hear how that pans out, Anne. Connect yes. me on LinkedIn <laughs> and tell me what the outcome is. Um, so multiple jobs in the same company, Anne was saying. Um, the candidate is known to my company as they have great skills. He's an analyst, so I'll analyze pros and cons. Okay, good stuff. Good. Right um fantastic okay cool well, i think that pretty much covers uh covers all of the questions the one last thing was naveed um was asking if i can change my light shade as it looks very 70s and um, so that believe it or not is the only thing in my entire house that i actually chose everything else is decorated by my wife the one thing that i have is that lampshade and i've just been yeah. hammered about it in front of 500 people so my wife will be delighted about that because every time someone comes into our house i point out that this lampshade is what i chose and apparently it is changing so thanks very much for that naveed uh, that covers i think pretty much all the questions if i have missed any because there's a big old stream in them and i might have clicked over one that um that i haven't meant to feel free to drop jeremy a message i'm sure he'll be able to come back to you and answer please do have a look at www.recruitinginlockdown. I don't know if I did enough W's there, but you know what I mean, .com, recruitinginlockdown.com. It's 20 quid and there's loads and loads of high quality content just like this available to you. Uh, thanks guys for questions. Thank Get it. following us on LinkedIn. Happy to connect. Thanks everyone. See you soon. Thank you. All right. Bye.